When you get in an elevator, nobody says they had a great elevator ride. They just got to the 29th floor. I'm excited about not improving the transportation experience, but I'm excited about eliminating it. Um, I think there's opportunities for Hyperloop to shrink time to access the things and people and places that you're trying to get to. Hyperloop is really moving cargo and people from everywhere to anywhere. I'm not going to sit here and say the Hyperloop is the answer to climate change, but what it is going to do is it's going to enable people to move themselves or cargo to where they want to go and do it in a way that's both energy elegant and has no direct carbon emissions. You build a tube full length point to point. Inside the tube we have pods that um, we could put either people or cargo in. Uh, these have to be sealed up uh, because out in between them and, and inside the tube is, is almost no air. So they're, they're like little spaceships. Uh, and then we, we accelerate them with linear electric motors. We're choosing a very low pressure environment uh, and what that lets us do is it lets us move uh, very quickly with very little air resistance. Being able to move between San Francisco and LA, for example, in 35 minutes changes uh, everyone's concept of where home is. Blade Runner is our vacuum wind tunnel where we use it to test the aerodynamics of the compressor blades we're building as well as the aerodynamics of the pod itself. I generally take the light rail because I kind of hate driving. It's, it's pretty insane how traffic is now and what we could do for that. Hyperloop is part of this concept of like, hey, we can actually do this and we can build new technologies and not rely on 20th century technologies and thinking anymore. The tension between public and private is at the heart of the Hyperloop story. As the tech industry has come down from Silicon Valley and established itself increasingly in, in Los Angeles and Southern California, it has brought with it to a certain degree a kind of libertarian idea about the role of government and what um, public works can accomplish and more to the point what they can't accomplish. In the same way that Hyperloop talks about a vacuum and this kind of frictionless environment for traveling at these great speeds, I think it's also operating politically in this kind of frictionless vacuum. Part of the story that gets left out a lot, if they're going to have a right of way that goes along the five, for example, if that's the ideal route, that's something that's going to require cooperation from Caltrans, from Sacramento, from the state government and from all the municipalities, theoretically, that that route is running through. And so the political complications that have really made life difficult for the supporters of high-speed rail will not disappear when, if and when Hyperloop is ready to be built. You can think of Hyperloop as just being a separate sort of parallel effort, but you can also think of it, any effort to promote Hyperloop as an effort to kill the high-speed train and kill the idea of public ambition in the state. There's enough transport needs out there for everyone, including high-speed rail. We're not trying to take anyone's place. I think we're trying to just fulfill the epic need that's out there today. Part of why we're doing this here in downtown LA, we have a three-acre campus and we're moving this fast, uh, is that we want to show people that big ideas and moonshots are possible. This was a city that invested really heavily in the car in the post-war decades. and. As we try to move away from that, I think we're discovering that the more options we can have, the better. So I think it's more useful to think about technological changes as being complementary to public transportation and not at odds with it, particularly in this period of limbo that we're in as the city builds out a more comprehensive transit system.